Hello and welcome to Cranfield University. In this interview series, we explore the role of philosophy and humanities more broadly for management, engineering, but also for our everyday lives. My name is Andrei Pavlov and I'm Professor of Strategy and Performance here at the School of Management. And my name is Toby Thompson. Uh, I'm the director of this studio that this thing is coming from. My interest is in continental philosophy, Heidegger and executive education. And our guest today is Luc de Brabander, corporate philosopher and fellow at the Boston Consulting Group. Luke, welcome. Welcome to Cranfield. Good afternoon. Luke, can I just start with a very broad question? Um, I've introduced you as a corporate philosopher. And yeah. so what is the role of philosophy in, uh, in the corporate world? And why do corporations need philosophy? To make it simple, if you take a business or a company you have two areas, one with numbers, accounting, computer, energy, market share, all that, okay? But you have another one without any numbers, ethics, atmosphere, uh, creativity, and many, many items are relevant, really matter for a business, but you don't have any numbers. And when I, I'm an engineer, and after 20 years, suddenly I realized that this part of the company, when, where you don't have any numbers, more managers were a bit lost. They couldn't, sometimes they cannot do anything. And I introduced philosophy, it's rigor where you don't have numbers. It's like a toolbox which allow you to be rigorous, even if you don't have any number. So you're saying philosophy introduces rigor into the non-numerical kind of part of the corporate life. Yeah, so I, I'm a mathematician. So I study applied mathematics and it's, my life is a bit strange, but I, my very first job, I was a teacher in mathematics. And when you teach mathematics, what do you want to transfer some kind of knowledge from you to the student? 50 years after, I'm a teacher again in philosophy. And you see how different it is because to me, there is no science of philosophy. When you teach mathematics, you transfer knowledge. When you teach philosophy, you transfer your passion, your energy, which is quite different. And that's where I think I can be useful in the in a business. Mm, there's quite a lot here that I would love to, to pick up on and, and unpack. But can I, can I just ask, so, so what does it look like then in a corporation, uh, bringing rigor into, into the narrative, into the words, into the conversations? What, what does it look like? Sometimes it begins with definition. So my first job in this new life was around creativity. Right. Creativity is, of course, matter a lot and you don't have any numbers. So I start to propose some definition to show that creativity is not innovation. You can be creative without any innovation. You can innovate without any creativity. And the first step for a philosopher is to ask and to propose definitions. And that's how I start to define concepts when you don't have numbers. And in the second phase, criteria. Well, when you're a philosopher in a business, you're not in the what people should think business. You are in the how people could think business. Mm. And I always come with, I never judge when an ID is proposed. Okay, fine, I don't know. But I can ask, okay, fine. How do we know two years from now we succeeded in this ID? That's what is called a criteria. So asking for definition, asking for criteria, asking for clarification. That's the role of a philosopher to clarify. I remember um, I was asked by a CEO that was 10 years ago. He told me, I, this big data, I even don't know where to start thinking for this big data. 
And we had a, a day together with his team. And at the end of the day, he told me, look, I'm happy because now I know where I should start. And this is an anecdote, but it shows exactly my, my job. I haven't made any progress on this topic, but with clarification, he knows now where to go, who to ask, etc., etc. Can I just a quick follow-up? Oh, if I, go if on, I may go on. Um, <laughs> when I was preparing for this interview, and I was I was um, uh, looking at some of the things that you wrote, and also your um, your podcasts, uh, I remember you talking about um, this concept of energy and the fact that definitions unlock energy. Is this mm -hmm. is this what you're talking about? Is this is this what's what's happening there? Exactly, exactly. I think to to assess the quality of a meeting, I use energy. If at the end of the meeting, the energy level is still high, this is a good meeting. And mm -hmm. I, of course, I don't have any numbers. So, so I focus on words. For example, when somebody is talking about a business model, I'll say, fine, what is a model? Because sometimes business in the expression business model, the word business hides the word model. So again, let's forget about the business. Could you tell me what is a model? Which are the strengths and weaknesses of the model as itself? And another, a custom, customer experience. Okay, fine. But what is an experience? So I always go deeper, deeper, and it's useful. I'm fascinated, Luke, by how you say the job of a philosopher is to clarify, to clarify, to clarify, to clarify. And I'm also fascinated by your attention to language mm -hmm. and asking people to use different words to explain what it is that they do. Can you explain more about that? Of course. First, I'm working in different languages and I'm, I'm born Flemish in Belgium, so I speak French, speak English a little bit. So I'm... I'm impressed by the difference between the two languages. For example, power in English. In French, we have pouvoir, force, energy, et puissance. So those four concepts are so different. And I hear people using power to qualify all of them. So I think it's an opportunity for me to be multi, multilingual. And so this, um, this the definition is... When you people, now let, let, could you repeat your question, please? Yes, it's your interest in language. And it's as yeah. if you're trying to scrape away the language to reveal something underneath it. A exactly, because um, I'll give you an example of creativity. So creativity is not about changing the world. It's a changing the way you talk about the world, changing the way the way you look at the world. Are you all very often use the example of Copernic. Copernic, those 1500-something, he told the world, oh, we made a big mistake. In the middle, you don't have the earth, you have the sun. So it's a big, big bang in our history. But the solar system is today exactly how it was before Copernic. And this shows the role of perception and it allows me to have as a definition, creativity is the skill, the capacity to change perception, not to change the world, to change perception of the world. Like, bon, Einstein, Newton, Copernic, none of them change the world. They change we as mankind look at the world. And very often when you change the words, of a company, you can change, you can unlock another perception and open a road to 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 more ideals. Can I give you an example? Please, sure. please, by all means, yeah. yes. Very, very. So I was challenged by a company in Champagne, the Champagne, and uh, they were looking for marketing ideals, and so they were talking about uh, bottles, and finally they were a bit exhausted. They couldn't find any powerful marketing idea. And then I have this idea. Please, could you tell me about your business, but please don't use the word champagne. What are you doing here? And they were a bit lost. And at the end, somebody said, hmm, our job, our business is about 
from having more successful parties. It's our job is to make parties more successful. I said, okay, so the problem is not to sell more champagne. The problem is now how to sell to make a party more successful. And I asked somebody, hey, give me an example. When is a party more successful? <laughs> and somebody immediately said, when the speech is better. And suddenly somebody has, oh, I have a great marketing ID. Let's print a little book, how to deliver a speech. And let's attach it to the bottle as a marketing gadget. And so this ID was suddenly possible because they use another word. They describe the, the company no more as a champagne manufacturer, but as a company contributing to the success of business. Is that what you mean, Luke, when you talk about other boxes? Sure, we can think outside the box, but really we need to create a new box. Is that what you mean? Exactly, exactly. Because out of the box, again, uh, your question was about the vocabulary. Bon. Many people around creativity use this expression out of the box. Fine, but what is a box? A philosopher has to answer to that. And when you dig a little bit, you realize that a box is a set of simplification. You need to have to invent, to produce, to do whatever. It's a set of simplification. And out of this box, you can have many ideas. And in fact, a, any idea somehow comes out of a box. And I try to convince people that a new box is really a, an issue. Let's go back to the champagne example. A party is not an ID for this company. It's another way to look at the business to unlock more marketing IDs. And, and hence, this party is a new box. It's a new way to look at the company. If you're in a bank and you, if you are asked to think out of the box, you are not asked to think out of the bank. You are asked to think out of the way you use to simplify the business of banking for many, many years, which is completely different. Mm. And now it allows me to have a clear difference between innovation and creativity. Innovation is the capacity to have more of the same, faster, cheaper, uh, more fashion, but it's on the same. Suddenly, you can change the box and to, to resume innovation by looking something differently. If you take the big example, you know, there's this, this company here. I have a big. Yep. For, thir for 30 years, they described himself, we are a pen manufacturer. Okay, that was the box. Out of this box, you can have many, many ideas. One color, two color, you can have mark or you can do many, many different things. But one day or another, you are a bit exhausted in this book. You cannot have a pen with seven colors. And at this given time, the, the problem is not to go more out of this box, it's to find another box. And in this example, you can say, oh, this is not a pen, this is something disposable. So the same object, suddenly I see it differently. I, oh, I'm not in the writing business, I'm in the disposable business. And if you look at your business with another word, disposable and no more writing, suddenly you can have razor, you can have a lighter. And if you look at big today, I think razor and lighter, like 20, 25% of the business. But the razor is not a writing device. It doesn't mean that the old box is dead. For example, I just recently read an article about BIC. They purchased uh, two years ago a new company around tattoo because tattoo mm. are now fashion and tattoo is somehow cheap writing. So this idea of, cheap, of tattoo could have been deduced out of the very old writing box. And so you have to combine, you have to combine so when you have an ID, a box like writing, you can have many, many products, and this is innovation. But to move from writing to disposable, it's in the mind. 
it's suddenly a new box that doesn't change the objects. It changed the way you look at it. Mm. So huh, what do you think, what do you think is going through the mind of your clients when they're thinking, okay, let's, let's invite a philosopher. How, how do you think they make that decision? I think they never ask for a philosopher. They, <laughs> ask, they, they want to solve a problem. And so now I'm born. I've <laughs> many, many years in the business. For, for 20 years, I, wasn't, I was a hidden philosopher. I never told anybody I'll do philosophy. I said, I'll do creativity. Oh, we're going to have ideas with you. And a CEO immediately see, sees the value of somebody around creativity. And at the end of the day, I ask the guy, what do you think I'm doing with you? I'm doing philosophy. And now for the last five, seven years, I present myself, I introduce myself as a philosopher. But nobody ever in the business purchase philosophy. <laughs> Nobody. So you have to disguise it and you have to solve someone's problem. I, I know, Luke, that you talk about creativity amazingly. Um, on one side of which I think you've positioned logic and on the other side of which you've positioned critical thinking. Mm. I'm intrigued to hear the difference between those three things. Does logic turn into creativity? Does creativity turn into critical yeah. thinking? Explain some more if you could. Yeah, so this is my last book. In fact, I'm an engineer. I graduated in computer science. Uh, that was 50 years ago. And I brought my tool. The tool I used was this. Wow, I've seen this yes. on Apollo, I remember Apollo 13. Yes. Slide this rule. is, okay, a slide rule. I study computer without computer. I was first to go into concepts, applied mathematics field. And this machine was incredible because this was analog on this side. Mm -hmm. And if you can see digital on the other oh, side. Yes. Wow. This is, and so I had like something here and you can move it. I try to do it like this and you can do, do things. I've never so, seen that. But when I started, I used this and I, yes. I brought this because of you. This is called a punch <laughs> card. I don't know who, who looks at your show, but maybe the, well, that was my first one. For 20 years, I was an engineer. I was an engineer on Bong. I was hired by a bank. I developed computer and I was not unhappy at all. Not, a, but it was to me logic, logic. Then I, I went through my midlife crisis. I was 42. I was the CEO of the stock exchange here in Brussels, small one. And suddenly I realized, no, I won't do that all my life. And what happened at that time, I turned my passion into creativity. That's what I did when I was 42. And that's why I went back to university for nine years to, to study philosophy. And that for like four, 25 years of my life were around creativity. I disguised myself around and behind the word brainstorm and things like that. Now I'm 75. So I became a grandfather. I became more a teacher. And I say, okay, in the end, logic and creativity are okay, interesting. But one day or another, you have to convince other people. You have to exchange. If you have a bright idea, how do you convince somebody this is a great idea? And so slowly, and maybe because I'm turned 65, I say, okay, now, and now I'm investing all my energy in critical thinking, maybe because of technology and the fake news and all those things. And when you see chat GPT, oh la la, this is really a shock. I'm, I'm really good in computer for now 50 years. Honestly, this is one of the shock of my life. <laughs> I remember when I saw the first small calculator, Apple II, I was shocked when the first time I saw, uh, bon, the windows, the, the, the screen window with the, that was a shock. But what I have seen now, it's really a shock. And when you see chat GPT, nobody can go against chat or others, this, I think it's impossible. I heard that Italy wants to disconnect or to unplug ChatGPT. Mm. It is simply impossible. 
the impossible. So the main, uh, the, 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 what do you say, the main tool people need today, to me is not creativity, not logic, is critic to really to deal with things that happen today. And that's why I invest so much in the, um, yes, all this critical thinking. I just did an experiment this morning. If you go uh, to Google Translate and you ask the French translation of an architect, the answer is un architect. You do the same for a secretary. The translation in French is une secrétaire, une mm. secrétaire. So female. That, that is critical yeah. thinking, maybe at the mm -hmm. simplest level, but why an architect and on un? Of course, that's a, we go back to language, of course. And if you don't uh, learn how to deal with what's happening, to doubt, to... Um, in fact, critical thinking is to assign trust with caution. If you look at the history of philosophy, you have the two extremes. Skeptic didn't believe anything, because truth doesn't exist. And on the other hand, you have people who believed everything, which is not useful. So the challenge is to put the cursor to assign your trust with caution. And that's what I try to, to teach to, to my students. If, if it's possible to teach, and I'm not sure, so to convince how important it is. Uh, you're pre preempting my question, Luke. I mean, do you think it's possible to teach this? Uh, how, or is it something that you develop through <laughs> life experiences? Or is it something that's given to you at birth? <laughs> so if you go back to the three modes of thinking, um, logic you can teach. Everybody agrees. And mathematics you can teach. The problem with creative and critical, it's a double bind. In when what you, sense? You, in what sense? You deliver two messages which are in contradiction. If you tell somebody you should be critical, think by yourself. It's a paradox because you tell somebody not to listen to you. And if you ask somebody, be creative, it's okay. It's another double bind because it's telling somebody don't follow the rule, but the rule is not to follow the rule, etc. So... To, to answer your question, I don't think it's possible to teach creativity and critical thinking. Hmm. But I think it's possible to convince people how important it is. And you can give tips and you can help them a bit like a tourist guide who visits a country. You definitely can be useful. But I don't think you can teach in the sense like geometry, you go book one, book two, book two, do, 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 do. No, it's, no, I don't think so. Of course, you have creative techniques, but that's mm, very little, very little. It's, it can help, but I always have this image of somebody in front of uh, a piano handcuffed like this. He has handcuffed. And so you ask, oh, he, he cannot play piano, of course. And then you free him and you realize he still doesn't play piano because he never learned. So you have two, two levels. The one level is a constraint. And I think this level is more important than the other, than the, the, the music itself. But bon, that's it. Yeah. So to me, it's not possible to teach. You can show the importance, definitely. And that's, say, if you want somebody to build a boat, don't sh show him wood, show him the sea. <laughs> so, so look, can we can we just stay with this for a, for a second? Um, so, so what is this creativity? Is it is it like a latent capability that's hiding somewhere and needs to be just tapped? Um, is it is it a general attitude to life, or where where does it come from? I'm a grandfather, and when I look at my grandchildren, it looks like they have an infinite creativity, and I would say creativity is about not to remove something that exists at the beginning. And so this is the paradox in education. On one hand, you have to teach children a lot of material, but on the other hand, you should try not to remove the chance they had when they were so ignorant of everything. That would be my, my, my answer. 
Look, I'm very drawn to how what you're saying, even your background, is very similar to Thomas Kuhn in the 60s, who <laughs> had the famous book of Structure of Scientific yeah. Revolutions and the Paradigm Shift. Yeah. Um, and uh, his accusation or the accusation leveled against him, of course, he was never happy with that book, but the accusation leveled against him of it being a relativist. Is there a standard of judgment um, higher than the current box that a corporation is in? How would you even begin to measure that standard if you stay within these boxes? I guess I'm a little, a little confused and a little constricted by these boxes that you're talking about. But a box is at the same time uh, a constraint and, and an asset. If I'm from the business world, so if you want to build a business, you have to free some ideas. I'm going to do this, and that is the box. And if you change the box too often, that nothing comes out. And a box is fruitful because it's frozen. Imagine a company where every Monday morning there is a mail update of the strategy. It's immediately paralyzed. A strategy is useful because it is frozen. That's the beginning. And to me, a strategy is a box. It's a set of simplification. So you freeze the strategy for good purpose. And then you do things. You produce, you hire people, you do a lot of things. The problem, the world is not frozen. And so a gap, so slowly you will have a gap between the frozen box, the frozen strategy and the world. And one day or another, you need a new box. You need a new box. It's The question is not to keep the box forever or to change. It's going to happen. The real alternative is, do I choose my new box or shall it be imposed by somebody else? And I call this Eureka or Caramba. You cannot keep the same box forever because the world is changing too much. So the, you need a new box. And the choice is either you build it, you decide, or you will be the victim of someone else's uh, decision. And to, to help people, uh, I try to convince them should buy, you should design, you should craft, you can choose your, yourself the box. Otherwise, you will be in trouble. So take responsibility. I, I, what I'm hearing you say, take responsibility for your box. That's what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. So I use a lot of thought experiment. Imagine a perfect company, a company where everybody works perfectly. What's the role of the CEO? On one hand, you say you can play golf. No, no, <laughs> because the world is changing. And in fact, on his or her agenda, there are two items. Which is the new box? And when should I implement it? That Those are the two points, the two items on the CEO's agenda. The rest you can delegate. You can hire IT and human resources. You can do it. But this is the role of the CEO. Which is the new box and when do I choose? Another good example is Philips. When I was a child, Philips was mostly home appliances, coffee machine and uh, all this uh, wash machines and TV and radio and so on. Today, Philips is a health company. Today, 70 or maybe 80% of the business in Philips is around health. And of course, when 30, 40 years ago, you are the CEO of Philips and you look and you see Samsung and others from the Far East, you start, oh, you're a bit scarce. What shall I do? And you will not save the company with a new coffee machine or a super TV, I don't know what. You need a big thing. A big thing are always made possible by new boxes. And one day, at the highest level of Philips, they decide we go into health, into health. And this saved the company. Without this move, Philips today doesn't exist anymore. And so this is an example. And creativity, you see, it comes from two sides. At the highest level, at the CEO level, it's about choosing the box. We go into health. And then you can go everywhere in the company who has ID, and that's what I call filling the box to, oh, of course, oh, we do do that, but within the same bon frame, which is the new box.
Mm. Uh, very often when we talk about philosophy, we, we say that it's a, it's a deeply uncomfortable thing to do, right? Because it, it forces, as you, as you said, it, um, it, it thrives on doubt. Uh, it, re, it forces you to rethink your ideas, some of which you may hold very dear. And yet you're saying this is an inevitable um, path towards developing, developing a company, towards, towards growing and, uh, and renewing yourself. Absolutely. So, so I suppose my question then is, um, who, well, let, let me phrase the question. Um, what does it take for, for a CEO or someone in the company to have enough courage to ask those questions? You have the answer. It's courage. It's feeling I'm in charge. This is my role. This is my role. And why is it so uh, frightening? Because there is no science of choosing the new box. When exactly. the CEO, the CEO decides to go into health, when Philips decides to go into disposable, there it was not possible to be 100% sure this is the right decision. There is a kind of risk. And I think Europe, Europe is quite risk adverse. The European computer, when I was 30, 40, I worked on Olivetti, Siemens, yes, ECL from England, uh, Logabax and Modem. The entire European industry disappeared, disappeared. Not because poor engineering, not because bad products, no, because they didn't ch change the box. They didn't go into personal computer and, and, and things like that. And that, of course, you put the words, it's it's frightening to change the box. When you see, you, you go, hey, we go into health. Imagine, imagine. But Philips is a good example because when you compare, for example, an uh, incubator for premature babies and a, a microwave oven, those products are quite similar. But imagine at the time of the home appliance, somebody coming, oh, I have an idea, we should go into incubator. It's rejected immediately. Mm. So, but if the CEO opens a new box, we go into health, suddenly the same ID rejected before becomes quite obvious. Yeah, let's do that. I'm interested, and I want to go back if I can, Luke, to your notion of clarity. Because sometimes when you think the unthinkable, if that's even possible, mm -hmm. you sometimes can't get that idea into the correct words. And I suppose my interest is in boundaries, pacing the boundaries. Mm -hmm. Is there a boundary to thinking inside of a corporation, to think the unthinkable? Um, what can you say about that? Depends on the company. So I've been in many, many different business, but the, uh, I compare the plane and the flight simulator. When the CEO accepts for a day, okay, I won't, I will leave my plane and I will go into flight simulation. Then there is no boundary. He and you have scenario thinking, you have prospective thinking, you have that. But some CEOs refuse to go into simulation because it's a bit, uh, they, they take a risk, they take a risk. And uh, so clarity is really the main word of this conversation. For example, hybrid. That's what happened last week. A hybrid car today is not hybrid. It's just a car with two engines. One is electric, the other is uh, gas. It's not hybrid at all, but people tend to call it a hybrid car. And no, it's not an hybrid car. It's like the, the organization of work. Today, people working Monday and Friday home and Tuesday to Thursday uh, in, the, in the company, told friends, oh, I'm working hybrid. Not at all. They just put aside two days and it doesn't work. To be hybrid be, needs to reinvent things, to break some rules. And that, so I fight against um, this. And another tool I use quite often is, in fact, philosophy, you have three directions. You go up, you go down, and you go on the side. Going down is about clarifying. To fight innovate, innovation is not creativity. Comfort is not a luxury. Uh, it's a, that is going down. Mm -hmm. Going up 
you take distance, you see strange analogies, and for example, you can see what has changed compared versus what doesn't change. I think philosophy uh, started when you look at change. 100% change does never exist. You always have side by side something that changed and something that doesn't change. And when you go this way, you can see the, the essence of the business. Let's take a very simple example. IKEA. IKEA, uh, for 70 years, they had a catalog, the famous IKEA catalog. From uh, They stopped last year, 70 years. And I had the chance to visit an exhibition of 70 catalogs of IKEA. What is different is very easy. The, the very first book was a set of furniture. You see a table, a chair, and so on. And that, and you see 70, like 70 pictures. You see the world changing. Suddenly you have a man on the cover of IKEA, and then you have a television, and then a computer, and then a, and a child. So you see. And of course, what changes is very easy to notice. But what hasn't changed at IKEA? And then you go, you touch the heart of the company, the essence of the company. And I think you can do the same with James Bond. If you go to James Bond today, the last movie, uh, you compare with the, when I was 17, I said, Dr. No, I, I remember well, James Bond and Dr. No. If you look at James Bond from on 70 years time, you will see a lot of differences. And probably a lot of movie would be forbidden today, but that's it. <laughs> but what's the essence of James Bond? What do you find the DNA of James Bond? Probably like British humor, you can have through the 70 years. And so when you go up as a philosopher, you see what changes versus what doesn't change. And what doesn't change in a company is really important. It's the identity, the values, the DNA. And it allows you to put words on that. And I ask participants, I need words on what doesn't change. And then the third movement is on the site. And that's about creativity, talking to other, talking, uh, taking other perspective, looking at your company through someone else's eyes, etc. But it's all about clarifying. I got a follow on from that. Yeah, go, go ahead. on. Go ahead. Um, I'm wondering whether for corporations bringing in a philosopher allows the corporation to come up with, I guess, what you could call a canon of prohibitions, things mm -hmm. you shouldn't do. And it sounds like you're saying you shouldn't be obscure, you shouldn't be evasive, and you shouldn't be confused, nor should you be negative. And yet some of those things are quite positive, are quite helpful to be negative. Can you consider a canon of prohibitions? No, the answer is no. I try to emphasize the good side of being this. I never talk about the bad side of not doing this. And so when I, I'm in a company, uh, this is not always a friendly environment. Um, and I, I touch important things and Sometimes people feel threatened. And so I try to be a dip diplomat. And I, I prefer to emphasize the good side of philosophy and not to talk about the, the negative or the forbidden things. Uh, no, I try not, but that's my way. <laughs> and I think you almost preempted my next question, which is um, what are those forces that that resist your intervention in these companies? What, uh, what, what sort of pushback do you get from where, from what corners of, of the corporate world? People don't like change and that's it. So if you take the Prince of Machiavel, uh, it's of written course, yes. uh, 500 years ago. And so nothing is more difficult than to change the order of things. And that's fine. Today, the words are different, I read. So the only person who really likes change is a wet baby. And I don't, I don't work with wet babies. So people, <laughs> don't, they, they, don't like, they don't like change. And so I try to uh, convince them that, the, the, I repeat myself, the question is not change versus not change. No, it's going to happen. The question is, do you want to? run to lead to decide your change 
or do you want to be the victim of someone else's decision? And slowly, and so I tried like a diplomat to move things. And of course, I never worked face to face. When I have a work, I always have like 20 or 12, 18 people around me. And I try to see who is in favor. And so I try to navigate through the, the internal forces and to... So I, I love this bacon. Uh, you have to obey the forces you want to command. And so yes. if within the company there are forces, and if I want them to obey, I, I have to obey their, their themselves. So it's a, a bit of paradox, but I like Francis Bacon a lot on, on that one. Can you say more, Luke, about your injunction, be who you are? I've heard you say that several times or become who you are. Say more about that. I can have two answers. One about me. So um, it took me 42 years to understand who I was. And when I was 42, I said, oh, in fact, I'm not, I'm not an engineer with a lot of creativity. I'm a creative person who study engineering like this. I did this swap. And I realized I'm a philosopher. I was 42. What a shock. So on one <laughs> hand, the good news, I knew who I was. The other hand, the bad news, I was nowhere. I was nowhere. And then the niche uh, injunction, become what you are, I understood. I went back to university. And I can tell you, it was not easy at all for eight years. And still today, I have this feeling. I've, I think I'm still becoming who I am. That that that's it. And uh, did I answer your question? Now? Well, yes, it does. Yes. And if you're an executive or if you're a business school or a consultancy offering development for executives, how do you do that? How do you say be who you are? It's an open ended question. There's no obvious answer. But what's what's your what's pops into your head? Hmm. To think more, to think, think more and not that's... not to think differently, but to think no. more. Voila. Very often about creativity and about philosophy, I I hear things like, you should think differently. I never use this expression. <laughs> I never tell anybody you should think differently because I don't know who she or he thinks. But I can tell without taking many risks, you should think more. And to enjoy thinking. The, really, there is a joy of thinking. And that's that's the way I work. Which is not always the case inside of a corporation. Um, no, I'm looking, Andre, I'm looking course. as much as you. But uh, no. thinking thinking is hard, and certain certain cultures are suspicious of, dare I say it, intellectuals. Yeah, absolutely. So, of course, depends on the value. I've worked in 100 different companies, at least, at least. It is a variety of attitude towards when you go into the United States, people are less risk adverse than in, in Europe. Um, I always, in, when I'm in France or in Belgium, I tell people, you know, uh, Bill Gates and uh, Zuckerberg and other, they started the company without having finished their studies. So they left university before graduation. Personally, I told my son, you can do what you want, but you finish first. So I killed his creativity. So I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And yet it sounds like you're saying you can, maybe we should, maybe executives inside of corporations should violate uh, conventions. It sounds like you're saying that. Somehow, yes. V yes, yes. Because I'm convinced that if you don't do that one day or another, you're dead. If you, because a convention by definition is a hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And when I'm asked what is a strategy, my first word is an hypothesis. It's an hypothesis. And maybe it was the best one at the time you decided to go this way. But maybe this hypothesis today is not the best could be it could be different i use a lot of metaphor and when i describe my job i think okay i want to provide ceo with maps maps first to locate themselves and then to orient themselves that's the role i can i think i can provide people with 
relevant and useful maps. Maybe that's my job. I'm a geographer. So. <laughs> a cartographer. I never thought about that one. <laughs> Just to come back to something that you mentioned before, so you started as a teacher and you said you were, uh, you found yourself moving back into education. Um, Somehow, yeah. And I know you also have a very highly rated course on Coursera uh, about what managers can learn from philosopher, philosophy as well. And yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, go, go, ahead. Go, go ahead, you were going to no, say no, something. No, 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 go ahead. You. My, my, my question was, um, so... Where do you see philosophy, the, the, the role and the place of philosophy in education? Should we teach it in business schools? First, I don't think it's, you can teach it simply at all, but I'm really convinced there must be a room for philosophy in the business schools. And when, when I go, in fact, my life is, is incredible because I, I was hired by BCG when I was 52. I don't know, you know, this kind of company, normally you enter when 24, 25. I was yes. 50. Yeah. And so what happened, I suddenly became a partner in this company without any numbers. Can you imagine that? In 25 years in BCG, I haven't used a single number. I haven't used any and produced any single slide. Can you imagine? Boom. But BCG is not a non-profit organization. So if I survive 25 years at the highest level of this company, it, it shows there is somewhere a value to what I do. And of course, the company is very large and a lot of company understood the power of thinking more. And I was happy to help them to think more. So BCG sound to have cornered this market. Uh, do you see any trends in either competitors doing similar things or movements since you've been doing that for those 20 something years? Oh, yes. Oh, absolutely. When I decided to call myself and to introduce myself as a corporate philosopher, I went on Google. There was nobody, nobody, corporate philosopher, no, nobody. <laughs> Today you have dozens and this is good news. This is good news. But maybe something is important, and I should have mentioned before. If you organize the world of philosophy, you have two main areas. One is the art of thinking, and the other is the art of living. The art of living, about ethics and so on. I'm completely in the first one. Mm -hmm. I don't go into ethics. My business is about epistemology and logic and creativity all around knowledge and ignorance. Uh, bon. I haven't any um, experience in ethics. And, so and to answer your question, in this second world, suddenly there is a huge need of help, of support. And the um, new bon, CS. Social Responsibility, C, uh, CSR, CSR. CSR yeah. yeah, this is quite new. It didn't exist 20 years ago. And so there is a need and a demand for philosophy for in the two areas, in the art of living, because it's new and everybody's asking now for more ethics and for rules and criteria, and in the art of thinking for this uh, chat GPT and... <laughs> and uh, an extraordinary movement in, in machinery and artificial intelligence. So there is a need. And I'm, I'm convinced there is a trend like that in philosophy in the business. And of course, business school should be ahead of it and, and go invest in, in that. So it sounds like you would recommend maybe going back to education for an executive because you've done it yourself. Uh, I don't, yes. Well, to me, it was the best decision of my life. It was an enlightenment, really, really an enlightenment. Uh, it was not easy at all. I was 42 and to go again from exams and things like that. And probably I was lucky because I was with students 18, 19, 20 years old next to me. And when I looked at them, I said, hey, this is too young. <laughs> I'm I'm really a lucky man because I studied mathematics when I was 20 and philosophy when I was 45. This is the right timing. Yes. If I had, when I was 20, I was close to philosophy. I, 
I would simply ignore it. And well, life sometimes has good side and I'm a privileged man, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, I would say that um, your your experience matches my observations as well because um, there is um, there's there's quite a lot of um, quite a lot of debate and quite a lot of conversations about whether we should bring philosophy to let's say undergraduate students, mm -hmm. but I disagree because I think the undergraduate students are focused on getting a job and focused on on other things, and it's only after they come back having experienced life that they are really interested in these big questions. And that's what we see in our audience as well. But at least tell them it exists. Yes, yeah. So it's, a, it's sensitizing them to this. But... Or this guy. You do things, you don't call it philosophy. And 10 years after, you know, you tell what we did together 10 years ago, that was it. Yeah, that was the critique of pure reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, you seem to be very keen on responsibility as an educator, which I think is fantastic because maybe as educators and influencers, we don't realize that we have a responsibility. You seem to be taking your responsibility very seriously. Yeah. And one an additional reason is that a machine cannot be responsible. Mm -hmm. And to me, the, the machine has two limits. It cannot be creative because a program cannot get out of its program and shouldn't be responsible of anything. But that's a philosophical point of view. So, and that's, I try to show people how important it is, all, all this. And I always go with simple example. I was born uh, nearby where Magritte was born. You know this? Mm -hmm. Running Magritte, Running yeah. Magritte. Deep, this is not a pipe. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I told the CEO, your balance sheet is not your company. <laughs> It's a simplification of the company and the balance sheet the, on January the 3rd is not true anymore because in fact, a balance sheet is never true. A model is never true. The, a model only can be useful and et cetera, et cetera. I, I had the chance to be a CEO myself so I can speak the language of those people and they somehow trust me. Okay, he, he, he knows what it is. So, okay. <laughs> Maybe a, maybe a slightly more personal question, Luke. Uh, so you've been doing it for a long time and you've thought about this for a long time. Um, and what's on your intellectual radar screen at the moment? What's, what's inspiring you at the moment? Um, I'm writing, currently writing a book on algorithm. Uh, so, okay, very timely. Wow. Yeah, and I'm lucky again because I didn't publish last year. <laughs> Imagine publishing the book in October last year. Yeah. You have to dump the book immediately. This is uh, so again. I was lucky, and I'm full time, day and night, on the writing of, of of this book about algorithm. So I don't. I read many many books around algorithm, history of algorithm, and uh, and how you can put and where, which are the limits of algorithm. So and. The, I've, I've just recently read the Turing, Alan Turing's life, and um, I, I, have, I saw the movie, the, and the movie is called The Imitation Game. I, yes. I saw the movie yeah. eight, eight years ago, but only today I understand the title of the movie, The Imitation Game. And the Turing test is about testing how a machine can imitate and what I write in my book, it's a bit of confusion because according to Turing, being intelligent is looking intelligent. I say, no, 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 no. If you look intelligent, that's your, et cetera, et cetera. And so I'm constant, now I'm working on algorithm day and night just to answer the question, <laughs> your question. And I found many books really interesting about no, what happening happening with those huge algorithms? And I, I yesterday I read a story of a, an American journalist for two days nonstop on Facebook. He liked everything. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. Like you like a cheese? Yes. Food? Yes. So day? Yes. Night? Way? Muslim? Jewish? Yeah. Yeah. Da 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 da. Yeah everything and he explained how slowly the algorithm 
became crazy right. because somebody like that, you cannot put him in any box. You cannot at the same time being vegetarian and, and having <laughs> meat. And so, and the argon became crazy. And slowly the way he was informed changed. And then he got some messages from some friends. Hey, what's happening with you? So, and this is, this is my new book. And it's so interesting to see, bon, the, the importance of thinking more about algorithm. Because everybody's talking about data privacy. And so in French, RGPD, to protect the, the data. But we should oh, put enough energy and as much energy in the algorithm transparency. We should, and of course, um, it's much more difficult, but algorithm should be transparent. It's not normal to be, yeah, you can test the algorithm. You can understand a bit more with critical thinking. You, yeah, why sh I'm informed of this, not about that. You can make some progress, but you need transparency in the world of algorithm. That's to answer your question. So I haven't read another book. <laughs> but not, it's only like that. I have to to deliver my book at the end of next month. So wow. <laughs> well, yeah, I was just going to ask uh, when it's coming out. I'll be on time. I'll be on time with this. And um, so I, I read about the history of of, a, of mathematics, the history of algorithm, and that's my current life. And where do you where do you draw your inspiration? Um, in general, to, to, to get up in the morning and do this? Philosophy. Using, yeah, so when, oh yes, definitely. That was an enlightenment. See, that's the way I should process it. Using the tools designed 2,000 years ago to talk about mm. today. Me mm. too. Mm. Yeah. Well, Luke, this was a fascinating, fascinating interview. You gave us so much to think about. And so maybe if I could ask you a fi one final question. Um, as you know, as you heard me uh, when I introduced you, um, the, what we are trying to do here is explore this, this gray space where philosophy, as we know it, um, touches the practical professions, right? Mm -hmm. There's this sort of interaction between uh, philosophy and, and practical professions. If there is one thing that you could leave us with, uh, what would that be? What would you say? The joy of thinking, the really the joy of clarifying, the joy of understanding, the joy of transmitting. Oh yes, definitely. Fantastic. Libido, libido chendi from Saint Augustin. Libido chendi. I think there is a real libido in thinking. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you so much, Luke. Um, thank you so much. We really enjoyed it. Um, I hope you did as well. Um, and, uh, and hopefully uh, one day we'll see you in Cranfield in person as well. I'll come with really, I would like to come. Definitely. My main problem is I'm so passionate that my language, my English is damaged. When I speak slowly, I don't make that many mistakes. But when I accelerate, oh, voila. So, Luke, your message is loud and clear, loud and clear. So don't worry uh, about that. Okay, that is very nice from you. Yeah. <laughs> and congratulations for organizing what you do, because this is really the best way to, to help students in the business school today. Wow. Thank you for that. Thank you. Brilliant. Luke, thank you very much indeed. Talk to you thank soon. Thank you. Au revoir. Bye. Au revoir.